In terms of the phonetic uh, characteristics, it's really never possible to separate out and say this part of the sound corresponds to intonation and this part corresponds to stress because much of what we call stress depends heavily on pitch movements. Um, so the two are, are so tightly linked together that in a purely physical, phonetic way, it's virtually impossible to cut off one from the other. If we try conceptually to treat stress without looking at the intonation, then uh, we are essentially looking at where we put a stress. In other words, we can abstract the problem, say, forget how this interacts with the rise and fall of the voice, the pitch of the voice in intonation. What are we actually doing when we use stress? We are placing a stress in particular places, and we need to know how we are doing that in terms of the word, and as you know, also above the word level um, in what used to be called sentence stress, before we realized that sentences don't have very much to do with it. If, on the other hand, we try to take stress out of this and uh, conceptually look only at intonation, what is the residue? What do we have left when we take out the placement of stress in words, the placement of stress in larger units than the word? We have to consider pitch levels and pitch contours, and we have to look at some of the other prosodic features that Crystal talked about. And if I can anticipate what I'll be saying a little bit later on, there are some books on intonation which imply that when you have identified the pitch levels and contours, you have said everything that's necessary to be said about intonation. And if there's one thing that I've carried with me ever since the days when I first uh, worked with David Crystal, um, it is that you have never finished telling the story uh, Describing the movements of pitch is only the beginning of describing the properties of intonation. Some people have quite explicitly set out to describe the phenomena of stress in English with no reference at all to intonation. And I think if you wanted an example of this, the one I would recommend uh, again, this now belongs to ancient history, but the sound pattern of English by Chomsky and Halley, uh, which made my life a misery for 10 or 20 years, um, gave a very elaborate treatment of stress, uh, basically taking the position that a small number of rules telling you where to put a stress will work for uh, word level stress and for word, uh, above word level stress, and that you can talk about stress uh, all the way through a, a book of 500 pages and never once mention pitch or intonation. In fact, they don't even, uh, the, the word syllable doesn't even appear in the index to Chomsky and Halley. Um, but uh, that's an extreme example of one where, which says stress and intonation, we can put away intonation, that's something for psychologists to deal with or sociologists. Uh, and we linguists will concern ourselves with the really big topic, which is the placement of stress. I don't know how many of you have tried studying Chomsky and Halley. Uh, it, these days, it would largely be for historical interest. But um, in the late six, in the, at the end of the 60s and during the 70s, if you couldn't quote large pieces of Chomsky and Halley, uh, you were intellectually dead as far as uh, the linguistics world are concerned. What are we doing about stress right now? Um, over my career, I've seen a lot of theoretical approaches come and go uh, in the context of phonological theory. And uh, when Hector invited me to come here and talk, I said, OK, as long as nobody wants me to talk about theoretical phonology. And it's one of the privileges of old age that you can say things like that. <laughs> Um, I've seen generative phonology come and almost go. It's still around in, in a few uh, corners covered with cobwebs, but uh, it's not dead. Metrical phonology was big news at one time. Autosegmental phonology rather less so, but certainly very influential. And uh, at the present time, optimality theory is still 
flourishing and among a certain uh, section of people who work in phonology, in language acquisition, um, and in psycholinguistics, optimality theory is very influential. But essentially these are all highly theoretical approaches, approaches which are less concerned with real data and more concerned with an elegant way of stating facts about, uh, about prosody. I don't want to, to be too um, dismissive about these. Many brilliant people have worked on these and produced some brilliant work. But it doesn't do anything for me personally, and since I'm allowed here to air my prejudices, uh, I'm treating these as something which has th the things which have appeared, but which have not, to my mind, advanced our knowledge of stress in the practical business of how we use it in conversing and how people might learn to use it. This is a rather more controversial point. How much should we teach rules about word stress? Um, it's something where I've um, swung to and fro like a pendulum over the years. Um, uh, as you know, um, in, in Daniel Jones's work, and he was a pioneer in this area, uh, Jones more or less gave up and said, you learn the stress of the words as you learn the words. And I thought, well, that's a bit feeble, really. Um, we can do better than that. Um, and then, uh, working in a linguistics department, I became convinced that the job of somebody in linguistics, uh, which includes phonetics, is to discover the rules which regulate the way we use language. In other words, to give up and not try to make uh, usable rules um, is, uh, it, it is not showing the right spirit. Um, and I spent some time trying to learn a lot about rules. Uh, and a, a colleague of mine, Eric Fudge, produced a very useful book on English word stress. It is sadly out of print. And there are many textbooks around that will give you some, some guidance on, um, on stress placement rules. I think the sort of compromise that I end up with is there is no doubt at all that there is some regularity in English word stress placement, and therefore it is uh, in no sense correct to say that it's just, just a random thing. The fundamental thing that we're left with is, is it practical to teach learners rules, or should we simply teach them words? Um, and I think that's, this is something where, if you have the freedom to choose, uh, as a teacher, uh, you, you make your own decision. I personally would not spend time teaching rules for word stress with the possible exception, uh, as I put there, of uh, stress-altering affix rules. I think those are uh, easy to pick up, uh, easy to demonstrate, and are quite useful. But most of the others, you know, is this word a noun, or is it a verb, or an adjective? Okay, that means that rule three applies in this case. I mean, you can't do that sort of computation in the middle of a conversation. Um, I, uh, a few years ago, I tried to, to learn modern Greek, um, the stress placement in modern Greek is, I think, more difficult to learn than stress in English words. And some of their words seem to be longer than English words as well. Um, I was uh, given a lot of rules to learn, and they just didn't work for me. What worked for me was learning the stress with each word as I learned it. That's how kids do it, I think, um, and uh, that's my own personal prejudice. Most of the learning about stress is best done as a lexical property of the word, not as a global set of stress rules. But please don't feel that I'm telling you, I'm urging you to go out and do something differently. I'm just saying what my own feeling is about that. 